Hey everyone, Mark here. This podcast is sponsored by Engro Games, a brand new publishing company out of Japan. They're kickstarting two micro games right now Reach, a two player cooperative game, and Okazaki, a one to two player trick taker. They come in a limited edition handcrafted package and ship anywhere in the world. Click on the link in the description right now to find out more information before the Kickstarter campaign ends. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is special guest Patrick Rowland, designer of Fry Thief, which I've reviewed on the site, and uh, someone who's talked with a lot of other game designers. We're going to be talking about the process of design. I think more kind of the nitty gritty of it, from what I understand, is what you want to get into the the iteration and, and the yeah the process. I guess is the right word. Uh, but thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I super appreciate it. Yeah, I think this will be interesting. Fry Thief, or Fry, yeah, I said that right. It's, it's, I said it correctly, and it sounded in my head like I didn't. Fry Thief uh, was a fun little game. I enjoyed that. And that was your first design, right? Yeah, that was the first design that got that far, right? Like in college, I tried modifying a couple games and making expansions more or less, but that was my first real concerted effort to make a game. Yeah, and I was reading through, you have a blog that, where you talk about your work with, with programming and, and e-commerce and game design also, mm. and you kind of did that as a project of like, I want to make a game and actually get it made, and you mm -hmm. kind of documented all the steps along mm -hmm. the way. How was how was doing that? Uh, it was really good. So yeah, my, my day job is e-commerce. If you want to sell something on online, I've got 50 bajillion courses that tell you how to do so. And I, I think there's a huge difference between academic knowledge and applied knowledge. Mm -hmm. So this is, I have all the academic knowledge about e-commerce, but I don't have the like actual lived experience of someone who sells things online. So I made, I decided to make a product just to learn stuff on my own and have that learned knowledge. And, you know, for a while I was like, oh, I can resell these books or I can get light up dog collars or, you know, I was just thinking of all these boring products and I'm like, wait, I love games. Why not just make a game? And then it took me a year to like make the game and run the Kickstarter and then another six or nine months to fulfill after that. Um, but I'm really happy with the experience. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I've not talked to someone yet where I guess that was the motivation behind it. Um, it's usually people who are like, I want to see this very specific game come into being or I had this idea I'm excited about it but for you it was I want to actually work through what it's like to make and sell a game right yeah well yes but also like it was one step back it's I want to make and learn how to sell a product oh um, anything so at all yeah it, it started with that so like so if you want to go way back I usually set a big audacious goal every year so like one year it was run a marathon one year it was like get my yoga teacher training one year here it was move across the country. Like I have these big goals that year. It was, I want to make uh, and sell a product. And for a while, yeah, it was those boring notebooks or something. And they're like, no, why don't I just make a game? And I love games. So it just, it kind of worked out. So with Fry Thief, was that an idea that you had before or did you come up with it for this project? I think I started, it's hard to know exactly I, it definitely happened after I was really seriously thinking about making a game. So after I was really seriously thinking about making, making a game, I started what I think one of my best ideas is, is having an idea log. I have an, an Evernote folder just for game ideas. And so I just started documenting. And I don't know about you, but when I, like, I think when you don't document things, it gets really hard to come up with new ideas. But as soon as you start writing down, th writing everything down, then you get better at remembering them. And so I just, I have like 180 game ideas now. And I've only made like four of them into actual, or maybe eight of them into actual prototypes. Um, but I think Fry Thief was in the first, even the first 10 game ideas I had. Okay. So that was one of the, mm -hmm. one of the original ones. Mm -hmm. Why choose that one? Good question. Hmm. Uh, I want it. So there's a couple things here. I wanted to make something small um, because just for logistics purposes, like small in terms of components, but also small in terms of shipping and all that stuff. I think that was one of the reasons. I think I also wanted to make something lighthearted. I'm a big fan of, I'm not a big fan of super competitive games. Feelings get hurt and maybe you and I play with different people, but it, you know, when you play a three hour game and then someone gets crushed, they usually feel bad. So I like to make really quick games where everyone, you know, if you play 10 games, everyone's going to win at least a couple times. I like games like Love Letter. 
Uh, and then actually something pretty obvious. The Game Crafter had the hookbox challenge, and that was what made me go, oh, this is that was the restraint I needed to solidify. Because it could, oh, it could have been a 50 card game. It could have been a game with boards and cards and components, and we could have had whatever. And then as soon as you, I heard, I imagined, I was thinking about Fry Thief, and then there was a chat, the Game Crafter hookbox challenge. I'm like, oh, could I do this in 18 cards? I bet I could. Um, and so that was that was helpful. I, and also other games that inspired me. Love Letter is 16 cards, 18 cards. Um, there's another little one called, oh no, it's something monster, terrible monster. Um, it's just a quick two-player game that is somewhat similar to Fry Thief, whereas mine is a, really asymmetrical, theirs isn't. But like, there's just these other games that were like it. And I thought it applied well to the 18-card format. And now you mentioned constraints, um, mm-hmm. which... You know, you talk to a lot of designers. I've talked to a, a decent number, mm-hmm. and somehow that always ends up coming up at some point within the conversation. I found that there are some people who welcome constraints and they want constraints placed upon them to just hone in their mind, I guess. And other people hate them. Are you someone who who regularly seeks out? constraints to focus yourself i guess is my first question and then in your experience talking with other board game designers what have you discovered their preferences or their experiences have been yeah so i i've talked to 85 game designers something like that something like 80 to maybe 90 game designers on my podcast indie board game designers and i Boy, there's lots of really interesting things there uh, that I've picked up from other people. I do think, uh, boy, I, I, this isn't a question I ask them, but I would guess that many of them do like restraints. Many of them talk about how they were doing, getting ready for this ch- this challenge or this contest, or many people, or as soon as uh, the Game Craft or another prototyping service comes out with part X, like it's just this little, it helps you focus on a specific part of a game. And I think that's really helpful. It's not always constraints, but it's when when you have an infinite palette to play with, it it gets it's impossible to know where to start. Then if your favorite company comes out with um, a mint tin, no one's saying you have to make a game in a mint tin, but now you're imagining all of the cool game ideas that you just had in the last week in a mint tin. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So it's this yeah. it's like catalyst isn't the right word, but something like that. Yeah, yeah. And and how about yourself? Do you find that those external constraints help you? Absolutely. I have made, oh boy, since the since the Game Crafter Hookbox Challenge, which was like two years ago, January, I think I've made a game for almost every other challenge. Like it's really spoken to me and I've made a game for them. Many of them haven't gone anywhere, <laughs> but um, but they've made prototypes. I've officially submitted them to the contest and it's, it's been super helpful for me. And I, I think something else I like, this is different than c- constraints, but I also like finishing projects. I know that sounds silly, but I work, my day job is in software. You never finish projects. They're just, you just keep iterating on them and making them better and better and better. I love having when a game crafter or any, any company out there has a three month challenge contest for game design. I do everything I can for three months and then I put it down and I'm done and I can like be happy with what I have. So I also like, I also really like that. That's interesting because that's, Oh, I who I was listening to Ludology, the mm-hmm. Ludology podcast, a while ago, and back when Jeff was still on it, and he, mm-hmm. I think he was the one that mentioned some idiom or something that, mm-hmm. you know, a game is never finished; it just gets published, and that, and people usually lament that. I, I've talked mm-hmm. to people, and they're yeah. like, I have a hard time playing or or watching my mm-hmm. games after publication because I'm constantly tweaking it and and i know Mm -hmm. i can't actually tweak it at that Mm -hmm. point do you just force yourself to not have those instincts and urges of and and you can just put something down i mean look both of them are great so just as the exact opposite example my my girlfriend does theater and what is super cool about theater is every single night they do a show they go oh well let's change this one line and they can do those iterations and then i'm like oh wow that's so great you're not constrained uh as a perfect example for fry thief i forgot on my rule sheet to include one icon. So now there's 1500 copies of a game that the rule sheet doesn't mention what this icon means. And it's, it's kind of like an optional icon. It's, it's for advanced users. So it's not a big deal. And you just kind of, kind of have to learn to live with it. I think there's value in both, right? So my day job is all iterate, 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 iterate. And it's I'm currently working on this product that I'll keep working on for probably every year that I work there for five to 10 years. That's a long time to work on one project. You know what I mean? Sometimes mm-hmm. it's nice to to work on something for three months and then be done with it, put it on a shelf and appreciate it for what it is. 
Yeah. Let's talk about your podcast, Indie Board Game Designers. What have you learned in talking to all those designers? Like, What are some of the, the highlights, I suppose? Yeah, there's a there's a bunch. I think the thing I'd, I'd point people to is for episode 100, I did a recap of all, all of my... I sort of just did some stat and compilations of all of all the things that people did on my show. So, boy, I, I don't have the exact numbers now. Let me see if I can very quickly pull this up. But one of the things that I thought was really cool is I looked up how many people had an ongoing Kickstarter campaign and what percent of them funded just to like, just because I was curious because many people come on the show to chat about their, their Kickstarter campaign and it was above average. So in the industry, the industry average is like roughly two thirds. It's like 60%, 66%. And I think my show was like 70, 75. Sorry, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it was higher than the industry average, which I thought was really cool. And then I thought it was even cooler. I also tracked what percent of them eventually relaunched and then funded. And I want to say that was like 80, 85%. So there's something cool about, I think it's uh, maybe demoralizing. If you're a brand new creator, you go, oh, Kickstarter's amazing. Cards Against Humanity raised $50 bajillion. Everyone probably raises a million. And then you look at like real numbers and you realize lots of campaigns don't fund. But if you keep at it and you relaunch and you listen to people's feedback and you relaunch, there's a very good chance that you can fund. So that was actually my favorite statistic, I think. When I first came into the hobby, probably nine, 10 years ago, I think, you know, when I started consuming board game media and hearing talk about, you know, what it takes to get into design, the common knowledge was that there's like five people who make money designing board games and you're not going to become mm -hmm. one of them. And now mm -hmm. I think in large part due to Kickstarter, that's not necessarily true anymore. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're going to have a mega hit, but you can... Take a game idea, and if you want to put into work to self-publishing, you can make some money off totally. of it. Um, and the and even you know the the global odds of like sixty sixty five percent that's pretty good. I think so too. Like that's pretty remarkable that that many can fund, and there are a lot of resources and such to, to help you along the way. Is, is there something that you see, or rather, did you analyze the failures and and see any commonalities oh. there? Wow. Good, good question. So I'm looking at, uh, so I have the graph in front of me now, Sure. 85%. So 75% fund with that campaign and then another 10% fund eventually. So with a relaunch, I don't think anyone's relaunched twice. I think everyone's succeeded on their first relaunch. So that's 85%. Then I think one person had some weird technical reason. One person, like they're going to relaunch. They just haven't yet. And then only what it's about 12% of people don't actually fund of my podcast guests. I didn't look at the re reason why I, I'm looking back, looking back and through my thought catalog. I think people didn't listen to the market. I don't, I don't pick on a specific people, a uh, specific person that I'm thinking of, but some people made games that I just don't think there's a huge market for. I've heard from some people, you know, yeah, fantasy is overdone and there's a million wizard duel games, but also people like those. So you know, there's always going to be 100 people or 500 people on Kickstarter that are willing to back your wizard fighting game or your dragon blah, blah, blah game. Whereas if you make a game about cleaning sidewalks, it's a terrible example. I just want to I don't want to I don't want to pick on someone. Sure. But yeah. if you make a game about an un, un uh, totally unique, different, weird concept, then it's you've got to do extra work. Yeah. Did you find that challenging with Fry Thief? Because that's certainly not a theme <laughs> that I don't think exists, except in that game. Uh huh. Was huh. that an extra challenge? I think part of probably pro probably part of it was that there's probably some people who, first of all, for me, I think I think do, I do think many people have the experience of of uh, they either are a fry thief or they know a fry thief, right? Like their friend is one. That's they true. Never it's a, it's a human experience. Yeah, I, I think so. But there probably are some people who just don't get it. Maybe they're in a I don't know a hippie community where everyone shares everything. They're like, what is a fry thief? I don't I don't know. That's a silly example. But there are some people who probably don't get that and they probably didn't back the game. But I also talked to so many people who who were like, oh my God, you have to make this game just from like the title alone. Mm -hmm. And that was a very good indicator when your title can sell someone. That's a that's a great sign. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in, in the notes you sent me before the, the when you we first talked about this podcast, you mentioned this idea of quantity over quality, of of, of getting things launched and finished early. I'm, I'm curious if you can elaborate on that. So, okay. I'm generally a quality person. Like in my life, I'm generally a quality. I'd rather have a really nice computer than like lots of 
computers. I really have a really good knife in the kitchen than like lots of kind of mediocre. I'm, I'm generally a quality over quantity person. However, when it comes to ideas, I am 100 percent in the in the the camp of quantity. Here's why. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to reference a great book for all you game designers out there or just people who want to learn cool stuff. There's an amazing book called Originals by Adam Grant. He's an organizational psychologist. He has whole chapters on some, some of these topics. And one of the things that, that creators, so I'm just going to say board game designers fall into the category creators. One of the things we're bad at is we're bad at knowing how good our own ideas are. Like we're just objectively, we always think our ideas are cooler than what other people actually think of them. Like it's just a bias we have that we see the cool intricacies in our ideas and other people don't get it. So we don't know when we have a bad idea. That's the problem. So we think everything is cool. Every, every one of our ideas is cool. We don't, we don't know when we have a bad idea. And I think if you can just have a, make 10 ideas or make um a hundred ideas, there's some evidence that we don't get less. We don't stop coming up with original ideas until idea 200. So if I, if I kidnapped you, Mark, because kidnapping is fun, and I said to write down 200 game ideas, your originality would continue for 200 ideas. And then it taper off and you kind of just come up with the same stuff. And uh, in similar studies, you only come up with original ideas after the first 15. So your first 15 ideas are just iterative. They're just basic things that you could have come up with anywhere. And we all kind of do that. It's only it's basically the sweet spot is between 15 and 200. That's where you really come up with new, new, creative, awesome ideas. So just when it comes to idea creation, I'm just such a fan of coming up with a ton of ideas and then throwing all of them at the wall and then seeing what other people say about your ideas. So the other thing about creators is we don't know. Um, there's something amazing about, I think this was in the book Originals, but you know Bach wrote over a thousand songs. He doesn't know, he didn't know that his most famous song was his most famous song until other until his listeners told him. So I think there's something valuable about just throwing a ton of ideas at the wall, seeing what other people think about it, and then moving forward from there. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, no, that, that's interesting. That, that does make sense. I, I, I definitely see that people are terrible at self-evaluation. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not even just on your ideas in general, like self-evaluating <laughs> how you present to people or what someone thought of a conversation or anything like mm -hmm. that. But with, with ideas, I see that in my own life, I... I as a part-time job, I teach speech and debate. Mm -hmm. And what I always tell the kids and always remind them that the rule of thumb is that every debate team thinks they win about 75% of their rounds, which, yeah. you know, is impossible. Yeah. It's exactly 50% yeah, yeah. on average. Yeah. But you always come out thinking that you've done mm -hmm. better than you did. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's the same idea. The idea that, that on average, like, the first 15 ideas – aren't actually original is interesting. And mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, it certainly supports what you're saying. What's the process for getting through that? Is it just throwing ideas at other people? Is it getting a game, if we're talking about game design, getting a game to the prototype stage, testing, being willing to discard it? Or do you, do you go through that as quickly as possible without even prototyping. Yeah. Oh man, there's, there's so much I can talk about here. And this is also goes into, I mean, I'm, in, I'm in the startup space a little bit, so we can go into fail fast, which now there's a, a wonderful play testing journal, uh, called fail faster, but fail yeah, fast yeah. comes from, that, that looked really cool. Which, super cool. I had, I had him on my show, uh, Jay Cormier, super cool book, by the way, but fail fast comes from the startup world where basically they, Again, people don't know what's a good idea and what's a bad idea. So just make it, make a, and they always say MVP, minimum viable product. In the board game place, one of the things I, I like that I've heard is people call it minimum viable prototype, which just, I like making it our own. <laughs> um, because sometimes you do have this amazing idea and it just is, you. it's hard to envision what it, how it all works in, until you get it on the table. Just um, as a quick example here, one of the games I'm actually most proud of, which is it's in a finalist for the, the Game Crafter Mint Tin Challenge right now. So it's in the top seven. They're playing it and we'll see what happens. But I'm really happy with that game. And one of the things that was essential for me to do is I thought it was cool where you'd have the here's the, here's the premise. The premise is it's a set collection game where items can break, which other games have that. So you're collecting stuff they can break. But this is based on the Japanese practice of Kintsugi, where you fix things with gold and then they're worth more. So instead of items being intact or broken, they're intact or broken or fixed. And then they're sort of like worth a medium amount of points when they're new. They're worth zero points and they're broken and they're worth even more points when they're fixed. So I just added a new dimension to a very basic set collection 
concept. And so I just made the most incredibly boring prototype ever. Like there was just like, oh, this one's a bowl and it's worth a point. Um, this one's a this one's a jug and it's worth two points if you have a cup. I don't know. And it was a horrible, horrible, horrible game. But I just tested that one, the one thing, which was if you discard this card, it breaks all the other items in play. Is that fun? And people gave me really good feedback on that. And then I actually made the game. I, I had to do that. I, I didn't, the game was totally incomplete. There was no, I just made up magical points and we only played like two rounds. But that was, I just needed the, like two to three rounds to go, is it fun when this thing breaks, it breaks all our items in play and then you have to spend resources to fix it. So I do think there's something about prototyping Sorry, I'm, I'm. You got me excited. I'm, I'm, I'm just going on a rant, ramble here. I mean, it would not be a thoughtful gamer podcast without <laughs> a healthy amount of rambling <laughs> slash ranting. So thank feel you free. For, thank you for uh, enabling me. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I. But going back to ideas, when people are trying to come up with business ideas, let's go to startup world. They go, I don't know. How do I come up with an idea? Or, or, or lots of people are really precious. They have one business idea and they never tell anyone about it and they never do anything with it because they have they, they want it to be perfect. But uh, there's a great saying that I'm gonna totally gonna butcher listeners, you can look this up later. But it's something like I, you know, ideas are like buses. Another one is always gonna pass by. And I think that is totally true for game design, but you need to get into the habit of writing everything down. So as soon as I started writing down game game design ideas, like, oh, I was walking a dog and then my dog chased a squirrel. Wouldn't it be fun to have a dog walking game where there's squirrels and there's other dogs and there's a cat and you get bonus points for chasing the cats. And if you if you pee on a fire hydrant, you get bonus points. I never made that game. It wasn't that good of an idea. It was a pretty garbage idea. But if you get in the habit of writing all those down, eventually you do get that really good idea and you're so good at documenting, you like get all of it down and you, you know it's a good idea. And then I do think there's an idea of context. Like, I don't think my game Mint Sugi would work if it wasn't in like a mint tin or maybe something like it wouldn't have worked another in another idea. But right after that very first play test, like a week, maybe two weeks after that first, the like the conceptual play test, then that mint tin challenge was announced. I'm like, oh, my God, I've got the perfect game for this. So it was really good timing with an idea that I had play tested and. I definitely have over 100, probably like 150, 180 ideas in my idea log. So does that answer your question at all? Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I found I, I don't have as many game ideas written down. I have probably a dozen. But I found that something I implemented maybe a year and a half ago was uh, my friend was doing this organizational system. I forgot what it's called. Yep. I think it's fairly popular in terms of just organizing your life and mm -hmm. and stuff. And he sent me some information over because I uh, perpetually unorganized. And the part that stuck out to me and that I retained, and I didn't adopt the whole organizational system, was the idea that you just export your memory onto paper or onto the computer. And if you can do that consistently in terms of things you need to get done. So I just have a very basic checklist app. And anytime I think of, oh, I should do that, I just make sure I habitually write it in that app. And then I know almost as a, like a life heuristic that I don't have to remember things. Because mm -hmm. as long as I've kept up writing it down, I my brain can spend its time mm -hmm. focusing on things it's good at and not have to spend time worrying mm -hmm. about, did I remember to do something? It seems like the same kind of idea. Oh, yes. So this is so this is factually untrue, but it sounds true. So I'm going to share this anyways. <laughs> um, I heard this and it, just, it resonates with me. Your brain can either be used for processing or for storage. So every time you have to keep something in your brain, such as I'm going to the grocery store, what do I need to pick up? Uh, I need to get milk, I need to get bread, whatever. If you just write that down, then your brain can process and do other cool things instead of storage. When I'm jamming to my podcast, walking to the grocery store, if I've written everything down, I can totally get into my podcast. I can like imagine myself in scenarios. If someone in a podcast says, oh, you have to check out this book. Guess what? I'm going to immediately pull my phone. I'm going to write it down. And like, I can do that. But if I'm thinking about the bread and the milk that I need to pick up, I, I'm not going to do that. So it is factually untrue that your brain <laughs> cannot process and store things at the same time, but it feels very true to me. So I... I write down every single thing that I have to do, which is like grocery store, go do the dishes. Like that all goes into to a to-do list. Everything that I want to write down goes into Evernote. And if I want to hang out with a friend, it goes into Google Calendar. If that doesn't happen, I'll never see you. Sorry. Like that's just how my brain works. So I think you have to know how you work and then come up with the systems to, I don't want to say mitigate, but uh, work with work with your best and worst features. Mm-hmm.
with the people that you've interviewed on your on your podcast, mm-hmm. how much variety do you find along these lines of being like hyper organized? I, I mean, it seems like you're, you're. I mean, certainly to a greater extent than me. I, I do this in terms of just major tasks and, and remembering stuff, mm-hmm. especially with the thoughtful gamer. To being more freestyle, I guess, or, or mm. I mean, in terms of the game designers you talk mm-hmm. to, do you do you think that personalities there tend towards one direction? Hmm. Well, I'm prob okay. So I, I like that you called me hyper organized. I'll I'll take it as a compliment. I mean, I wish I, I was more organized. So I, I meant it as a compliment. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people are I, I want to call artists for lack of a better word. They they have their Magnus Open Opum. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. They have this idea of a thing they want to make, and they are going to make it. And I give those people lots of props. They're kind of singularly focused, which I don't usually have. I like having different creative projects every three to six months. And I think when you only have one project, uh, then it's a little bit easier. You don't have to have rigid organization like I do. You you can be a little bit more flexible and it's fine. And if you don't have deadlines, like I, as I said, I wanted to make, make a game in a year. So I had a deadline, a self-imposed deadline, but I had a deadline. Whereas other people can take two, three years and work on their ideas and play test and hire illustrators and do uh, it's more slowly than I did. So I would say I'm definitely more on the hyper-organized side of the spectrum. There are lots of people who just make things, and that's fine. I have a friend, Jeff, uh, Jeff Swigum, who's helped me. He actually helps me with like, 3D printing, and he helped me play test a whole bunch of things. He sort of got me into game design back when I lived in Wisconsin five years ago or something like that. And he just makes games for his friends. Like I don't think he's ever entered. I think he's maybe entered one contest with because I was like pushing him. Like he's just doing game design because it's the thing that he loves. And he like made his own version of Legendary. That's, well, now that I mentioned his name. But anyways, it's just based on one of his favorite TV shows, which he can never resell because he doesn't have the intellectual property. But he just made it for himself. And he like printed all the cards and they're all sleeved and they look cool. And it's with his favorite TV characters. And there's lots of people like that. Um, So you can take it to any level you want. Yeah. I mean, I, I spoke with Tom Russell a couple of months ago. And... I mean, his process was extraordinary because everyone except him that I've talked to that we've we've broached this topic has always said you get you get the game out in a prototype form as fast as possible. You know, like mm-hmm. you said, the fail faster thing, get out as fast as possible so you can find all the problems with it. And he just lets it sit there in his mind until mm-hmm. he's got the whole game and then he sits out and writes the rules, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is amazing. But yeah, I think there's a lot to be said, and I haven't gone through the process of making a game yet, but there's a lot to be said for getting something out in front of other people to get the feedback right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, look. As going back to an earlier point, lots of us are bad at judging our own ideas, but mm-hmm. if you're just an amazing board game designer and everything you come up with is great, then you don't need <laughs> feedback because uh, people are going to like it. But uh, probably for your average game designer, you're going to need to throw all your ideas out and see which ones stick. Sure. Thanks again to our sponsor for this podcast, Engro Games, who are offering two fascinating micro games on Kickstarter right now. Reach simulates three-dimensional movement and momentum in space as players work together to perform a zero-gravity rescue mission. Okazaki looks inward at the building blocks of life itself as players attempt to replicate a strand of DNA using asymmetric abilities. And get this, both games are a mere 18 cards each. Click on the link in the description below to find out more. With the people that you have interviewed for your podcast, what's the... Are are most of those people... I mean, you call it the indie game... Sorry, what's... Yeah. I have all the words, just not the order. (laughs) Uh, it is the Indie Board Game Designers Podcast. Indie Board Game Designers Podcast. I, I assume it's a lot of people making games for the first time. Mm, it's yes. Not true necessarily. Uh, well, that's or at least mm. publishing a game for the first time so, or one of the first times. My the reason I'm hemming and hawing right now is yeah. I I that's not that's where I am now. That's not where I wanted. That's not where I envisioned myself going. So so. Going back to putting your game, your ideas out there, I made the Indie Board Game Designers podcast to put out the first 30 episodes without like really looking at anyone's feedback. I just wanted to like create. Mm-hmm. And then I started looking at people's feedback. And then one of the things I realized from talking to listeners is that they really liked hearing 
new people. And so now I really focus on that. Whereas before I was like, oh, sure. So just as an example, at some point, I'm sure I'll interview Jamie Stegmeier, but he's like not really needy board game designer. He's like, he's hit the like professional <laughs> runs an amazing company level. Right. 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 So I, at some point, I'm sure I'm going to have him on my show or hopefully I will, but I'm not searching him out. I, whereas I search out people who are brand new. So that right. is, that is usually who I focus on people who are first time creators. Go on. Well, let me rephrase the question then of the people you talk to who are first time creators, who are first time designers or publishers, what's been your impression in terms of, I don't know what the phrase is I'm looking for literacy, I suppose, in understanding the process of making a board game, of designing or publishing. Because I know you were talking about Jamie Stegmeier. I mean, he's been someone who has, with his blog posts and his writing, has really given mm -hmm. a lot of knowledge to a mm -hmm. lot of people. And mm -hmm. I get the impression that before him, perhaps, there was a lot of people who really didn't know mm -hmm. what they were doing trying to publish board games. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, of the people you talk to, again, are they getting all this knowledge that's out there? Are they are they seeking it out and finding it and, and utilizing it well? Great question. And so I'm actually going to refer back to episode 100 because one of the things I always ask people is what is your favorite resource that you'd recommend? And people recommend websites and they recommend books and they recommend podcasts. They recommend all sorts of things. So let me just list three three things that they recommend. These are the top of each each one. The top site is the Stonemeyer Games blog. Mm -hmm. The top book, a crowdfunder strategy guide. That's Jamie Stegmeyer's book. And the top podcast is Ludology. So many of the people that I have on my show are pretty familiar. They listen to podcasts. They read books. They're reading Jamie Stegmeyer's blog. Lots of them are very involved in the community. There are a few that, because here's the thing. I think when you, like, if you, if you can get in, like, let's say you join the right Facebook group, then you will be flooded with all the right information, right? Where people, oh, look at this. Look at this uh, amazing blog post. Look at this game design video. Look at this. You have to listen to this Ludology episode, whatever. And I think many people get into that and then you're good. Uh, then then if you're in the right Facebook group or you're on the right BGG forum or whatever, you're good. But there are a few people who I talk to. Uh, maybe I'm going to I, I want to say like 5%. It's very low. Like 5% of people are just pretty unaware of some basic game design things. But but going but game design, but game design is the, is the core, right? That's the core of what we do. Then there's a whole bunch of things about Kickstarter and crowdfunding that lots of people aren't aware of. And that, but that's also like my domain, my wheelhouse. What I do for a day job is I understand marketing, online marketing and online sales. So a lot, a lot of people I'll talk to are like, yeah, I just set up my newsletter. I got 50 people on it. I'm like, oh, buddy, buddy, you got to get a lot more than 50 to have a Kickstarter launch. And that's just, it's not a mean thing, but like I've done so many email campaigns in my life that 50 people is just like a, a tiny number, whereas you probably need several hundred, mm -hmm. right? What's what's the most common things you see people? Uh, I, I guess the, the the biggest failure points in, in terms of marketing. Biggest, uh, so look, there's a fancy word in the startup space called product market fit. That means do people want to buy the thing that you're offering? That is the biggest failure. So a, a good example. So this could be anything. It could be your game is too big. It could be your game is too small. It could be the wrong theme. Uh, but just you just didn't people don't validate their ideas. So you need to go you need to go outside of your friends and family, go to a protospiel, go to an unpub, go to a game design thing where people are a little bit more harsh with their criticism. I had so many people tell me that Fry Thief is like, nope, I would never buy Fry Thief. Great. Thank you. you like and I it was, luckily it was a low number, and I just know that they're not in my audience. They're a heavy board gamer, they're a serious board gamer, they like party games for six or more people. Like there's a million people that don't want my game, and that's fine. But other people who like like light two player games, I better get a good number of them. And I and I did. But that was the product market fit is you have to understand who who likes your game and make and make sure it's not just your family and friends. <laughs> I mean, is is that the best way to find out that information? Just going to those kinds of events, or are there any other tools available? So there's a couple of things you can do. If you have a just I think I experimented with $80. I don't remember the exact number, but I experimented with $80 of Facebook ads. So I made a landing page. You have to know a little bit of like how to like make, make nice, pretty images and, and write some copy. But if you can do that, and let's say you point a couple hundred people to a landing page and you say, we're launching soon and zero people sign up, you either A, don't know what you're selling and don't know how to communicate it, or B, people don't don't want what you're selling. And you, you just use ads as like a way just to see, cool, we put a hundred people in front of this that 100 people who like board games, by the way, with the right targeting, and 0% of them converted, that's a pretty bad sign. Honestly, you get that feedback so much faster from playtesting. So yeah, you can do 
ads and funnels and conversion rates and doodads. And I have blog posts on that if you want to read my programming blog that talk about uh, how I optimize my landing page. But I think you can learn much faster from a, a proto spiel. Mm -hmm. Often when I posted art in various Facebook groups, people said, this looks amazing. Where can I join to hear more about it? So that wasn't like, I'm literally asking for like, hey, what's the feedback on this icon? But I'm also, I'm also showing the art of the game and the process. And people were asking me, hey, where can I sign up to, to about, where can I sign up to either learn more or support you when you do launch eventually? That's a really good sign when you're just talking about it and people ask you for your email list. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's very good. What are some other tools that you think are helpful along along the lines of marketing or testing an idea or even getting up to the point of, of launching a Kickstarter? Are there any key things people need to understand? So I would say one of the best things you can do is start a newsletter. Um, there, You can use a great service. It's called MailChimp. There's a bunch of them, but MailChimp is a free up to 2000 service. You can get email every single time someone play tests your game at a proto spiel, ask them if they'd like to be on your newsletter. Many of them probably like 50, 75% say yes. And that's fine if they don't back eventually, that's fine. But like at least at least get these emails. And then you can always test things like, hey, you play tested this a while ago. What do you think of the new title? What do you think of this box cover? You can like engage them with what you're doing. And then eventually when you do launch a year from now, six months from now, you have, you know, you have 50 people from of play testers that you've already collected. I think that's a really uh, important thing you can do. That's probably my number one marketing tip is to just, just to build a list right away. And every time someone play tests your game is just be, be, be kind, but it's like, Hey, do you want to sign up for my newsletter? It's very hard to ask that. I'm a, this isn't obvious, but I'm not an extrovert. So it's hard for me to like ask people for a thing, but the vast majority of times they're totally cool with it. That's, I mean, I have no knowledge in marketing. I'm, I have, I have, if anything, anti-knowledge in this field <laughs> of anything. And, and, and it all makes me slightly uncomfortable, but I, for, <laughs> but from an intellectual level, I find it fascinating. A newsletter yeah. to me seems oh. like it would be less than ideal because it can't be accessed any other way. You have to, you have to specifically opt in, right? Compared to something like a blog post where maybe you can get people's email addresses where they get notified when a new blog post comes up, but someone else could just find it also. Mm -hmm. Is it because it goes into the inbox of someone's email that they're just more likely to view it at that point? Correct. So I, I won't bore you with the details, but years ago, people talked about Facebook and Instagram and all these social networks that you have all this reach and you can spend all this money and get a bajillion, you can get 30,000 followers on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. But that's not, those are, they're, they're not your audience. They're part of like, they're kind of part of Facebook's audience. Like they, this is the only thing that you kind of, I don't want to say own, but you have, you actually have the ability to contact them at any point. So even if you have 30,000 Twitter followers or you have 100,000 blog readers, if you make a new post, there is no guarantee what percent of them will actually read that, see that, whatever. Like one of the things that bugs me is like, I, I'm on Twitter. I love, love chatting with people. But if you actually want to use Twitter for marketing, people suggest like, yeah, share the same thing for like a whole month at different times of the day. I'm like, I don't want to do it. That's ex you have to you have to go like special things that optimize when the exact time of day that you should tweet and how many times you should tweet. And it's a whole hullabaloo. Whereas with a newsletter, you can email people directly and it'll go to them. Now it might go into a promotions tab in Gmail, but it at least goes to them. Um, I, I just think it's the only guaranteed way to reach someone is an email address or, or a text message, but no one wants to do that. <laughs> no, that'd be, that would be awful. <laughs> yeah. Getting text messages from uh, uh, board game updates. Yeah. That's yeah. no good. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's really fascinating to me. What have you found is people's biggest challenge frustration when they're going through the process of launching a game? A, a couple things. Uh, so generally I'm going to say prototyping. And then I'm going to go back to episode 100 just because episode 100 was great because I looked back on the last 99 episodes and figured out some some averages or some interesting things. Yeah, yeah. If you go down to the best money spent, that's another question I always ask people, like, what is the best money you've spent? What, many of the guests recommended paper cutters, laser printers, cor corner rounders. Multiple guests recommended a tool to round corners. People recommended organizers, self-healing cutting mats, just a desk for game design. Like people, it is so it, it's so much work to actually make a physical prototype of your game that you want to have as many tools as possible to make that faster. The biggest one, oh, that I somehow didn't list on this post 
have some sort of paper cutter. Oh, sorry, a paper cutter in general. Or there's a couple like card cutters where they're they're made specifically to cut poker cards. Any of those tools will drastically help you prototype faster. I know for me, so my the most recent game I worked on was Mitsugi, and I have 42 cards, which are double-sided, unfortunately. So I have to cut out 82. When I make a prototype, I have to cut out 82 poker-sized pieces of paper and slide them in, and then sleeve them. That takes me like over 40 minutes. Like it takes me, that's and that's, I have no other components to make. I don't have like to make mats. I don't have to make a board. I don't have to make anything else. I just have to make 42 cards and it takes me 40 minutes. That's a long time. So by, you know, people, I've talked to a couple of people on my show who have bought multiple paper cutters. Like they upgraded to like the nice, pa- like a 20, they got a $20 paper cutter. Then they upgraded to like a $60. And then they're talking to me like, you know what? I'm just going to go in for the $300 paper cutter. Like they, some people, they they find these tools so valuable that that it's worth spending money on. And I will say many of these have very cheap options. Paper cutters are like 20 bucks for the cheap models. Corner rounders are like 20 bucks. An organizer just for storing your bits is 10 bucks. Like a self-healing cutting mat is another 10 bucks. Like you do not need to go. You can probably spend a hundred bucks and get a bunch of these tools. And then the last thing is if for prototyping purposes, I'm a big fan of automating. Like you don't want to, if I, let's say I change the way all my cards look all uh, 42 of them front and front and back. So it's 82 separate files. If you move your title down 10 pixels, you have to move the title down on 82 different files. That is an exhausting process. I either re- I have a graphic design service, which I use for my day job, which many people probably can't afford. So I won't recommend that. What I will recommend is something like component studio, it just it automates the whole you have an excel spreadsheet with all of your card data and you press a couple buttons and it goes to component studio and it exports it for all 82 cards is that a that program say, is that a program specifically it, for game design yes it is it is made by fun fact is made by the game crafter oh okay um, so and it integrates perfectly with it so if you use the game crafter already i i i uh, you would think i work for them i do not i just really like their their products and services um, but it just, it integrates with them and, and it's good for other things as well. Um, but component studio is just a good way to batch. It's kind of, I feel like everything component studio does is it's all about batching everything. So you have an Excel spreadsheet of all your card data, you import into component studio, component studio spits out 82 cards or 8,000 cards. What, you know, however many cards you have. Very nice. For your design work, you mentioned Mitsugi. Fry Thief is already out. It has already been made. Mm-hmm. You said you've entered all these design, all all these design contests, and you're constantly making mm-hmm. games. Do you have plans to self-publish another game? Oh man, this is an interesting question because I haven't really talked about this on my own podcast yet. But so I'm very happy that I made a product. I went all the way through, I, I from idea to manufacturing to shipping from China all the way to my friend's driveway because I live in an apartment. So I'm like storing it in their driveway for a little bit, and I'll move into storage space later. So I've gone through that and. It was a lot of work. I mean, that's just the the easiest way to put it is it was a lot of work. And I don't mind doing game design work. By that, I mean like more play tests and I love art direction. Like I love chat. Like I love thinking about icons and how I want them to look and where I want them on the card. I'm, 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 I like graphic design, but I don't like shipping. I don't like logistics. I don't like, I don't like pricing all that much. Um, and then I have to go to, uh, conventions for the next couple years, probably the next year. I'm, I'm hoping to sell through in two years. sell through all my extra copies of Fry Thief. The good news is I should say the, the, the project broke even, I technically lost $9. So my Kickstarter, I purchased an extra 1500 copies, a little less. Um, but the, the project broke even and now I can sell 1500 copies and that's all pure profit. That's cool. Oh, nice. That's, that's yeah. Very well and, planned. You know, I'm who, whoever, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm very happy I didn't lose money on, on the project. Cause that's a, a worry I had, but I don't want to have to go to cons to have to sell my game. Does that make sense? Like, mm-hmm. I also like going to cons. I like playing games. I don't want it to be a, a second job. So I'm really thinking about, I, I really want to make more games, but I think I want to make them almost as, I don't want to say art pieces, but like, I might only want to make a run of a hundred or a run of maybe 500. And so if 400 people back a campaign, uh, and I do want to do a campaign. That was really fun. I do want to do a campaign. It'll probably be higher price point because it's a much, you're making a lot fewer of them. I totally don't mind not getting a lot of people, but I just want to make games, make them beautiful, release them to the, you know, hundred people that want them. And then I'll maybe order 150 and event, you know, I don't know, sell those at cons to friends or give them to people as Christmas presents. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but something like that is probably what I'm going to do. I'm definitely going to make stuff, but I 
do not want to be a publisher is what I've what I've been thinking for the last last six months. Okay. Have you considered pitching the games to other publishers? Yeah. Yeah, I totally have. And I have pitched a lot of my games. And what's a little frustrating is I've had numerous publishers take my games home. So they're all close to getting signed, but I've never had a game signed, which is maybe like I want I want like an achievement. Like I feel like it's like a game design achievement to have your game signed. So I want that uh, achievement, even though no one cares but me. So I'm totally open to that, but I do think I do think I have an eye for graphic design. So I'd I'd want to have a I'd want to work with a small publisher who doesn't have a graphic designer, and then or where where they're open to me working with them because I I'd, I'd love to make the game look like how I want it to look if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So I don't think I'd want to sign on to a giant publisher that has their own art department, but I would be totally open to working with a smaller publisher who who who's flexible. In the games you mentioned so far that we've talked about, uh, mm-hmm. both been relatively small games. Do you have any larger games that you've built out or, or on the horizon? So my general, so almost all the games that are my favorite games, almost all, there's definitely a few exceptions, are games that last less than an hour. So I'm totally fine making bigger games as long as they last less than an hour. That's just sort of my ideal thing. And I don't know how it is with, I know listening to your podcast, you play with the same group of guys all the time Mm -hmm. or a similar group. So you guys can like learn a new game six months ago and then play it three more times. I always have one new person in my game group. So I have no desire to always teach a game. So that's why I like games that last an hour or less because I'm 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 always teaching a game. I always am. There's a couple exceptions. Like I love my favorite social deduction game of all time is Battlestar Galactica, which always lasts like two and a half hours. Mm-hmm. But but I play those with specific people. So I'm I'm open to making bigger games, but um We'll see. I'm I'm also a big fan of bringing games with me. I'm a very I live in like downtown Denver, so I love walking everywhere and walking to events and biking to places to to a friend's house. So I like bringing games with me, and I don't like bringing you know I don't want to bring Gloomhaven in my backpack. Right, that would be a, a miserable bike ride. <laughs> I mean, it'd be good cardio. <laughs> and yeah, 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 yeah. I I'd, I'd get in shape. Yeah. <laughs> get those back muscles uh, bulked up. <laughs> As you've designed more and more games, have you noticed any patterns with yourself in terms of how you design? Any tendencies you lean towards, things you use a lot in terms of mechanisms or ideas you always end up putting into your games at some point? Any any patterns like that? I don't think there is a pattern. No, there's one. There's one. How about this? There's a pattern, but I want to stop the pattern. So here's the pattern is... It is so hard not to use cards in board game design. It is so hard because they're just so useful in so many ways. They're affordable. They're they're very they're also they're like I like small games, so they fit. Like you can get a lot of game out of just this tiny little stack of paper. And I really want to make games that have more physical components, like more like something that looks like an abstract game. Maybe it isn't an abstract, but it has like tangible doodads that you move around the board. And maybe there's little icons printed on the, the the pieces, but I want to get away from cards. It's just really hard to to not use cards. I do have an abstract game, which is currently called Bank of the Realms. I don't like the name. It'll probably change at some point. But while you're moving around the board, there are these cool coins that you move around the board and do things with. But then you get you score victory points with cards. So even in my abstract game, you you're still going for cards, which tell you how to get the victory points and how many victory points they are. So I. I, I have not been able to escape from cards yet. That is a goal I have because I think it'd be also, I think it'd be more international. It'd be easier to to send to people. And I, I'm a tactile person. I like the way things feel like I like having big, heavy pieces. So I really want to get away from cards, but um, have not been able to do so yet. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of the, the small game go to, mm-hmm. right? Because you can, you can stack them, I guess. I mm-hmm. mean, you could just turn them into cardboard and then they're tiles. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, how about this? I, I want to get away from printed components. Uh, maybe other than a board, I'd be fine with a board. But other than other than a board, I want to get away from printed components. Yeah, yeah that's fair. That's mm-hmm. fair. So I'll, I'll use the phrase again because you you said you took it as a compliment. As someone hyper organized, seems to get a lot done. I mean, getting a game published in a year, like from start to finished, is pretty remarkable. I mean, usually when I ask, you know, how long have you been working on this game that's about to come out, the answer is like, oh, four or five years. I see a lot online 
uh, with people in the industry or general nerddom of people just eventually burning out of a hobby or burning out of a pursuit. Have you seen that in the people you've talked to in your podcast? Um, or at least e even just your general experience? Mm -hmm. So burnout is something that's been on my mind. A friend of mine, they review board games, and they've recently stopped reviewing board games. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of reasons why, but one of them is just like burnout. Like it's a lot of work. You don't get a lot of, you don't get a lot of feedback from people. And especially this person releases stuff on YouTube. And I think you just get lots of like, I can't believe you'd say this thing about my favorite game ever. How dare you? Uh, you know, negative criticism. And I think it, I think it turned out that this person had the, it was just the wrong mix of, of work and effort to, to fun. So I think we need to find that. I've been, so uh, going back to why I don't want to be a publisher because that's, that's the work. If I want to keep making games, I could stop now and I'd, I'd be fine. But if I want to keep making games, I think I need to pull back from it's, it's, that's the only way for me to keep making games long-term. I could probably make two more while I have the energy, um, publish them, use manufacturers, something, and some things are always going to be easier and going to be optimized. As an example, I've made a hundred episodes of my podcast. I've really optimized that process of how I reach out to guests, how I confirm them, when I send them the details, when they, I have a template for all the questions, and then I ask add a couple extra for each guest. But it's like a, and then I have a transcriptionist who I know and send all my files to, and they transcribe everything and they send them back in this format. And I've optimized, but at a certain point, it just gets to be too much. So. I think you need to find that balance between fun and work. And that that probably means, so here's the thing. I'm very happy I made a game once. I've gone through the process. Now I know what's worked for me. For new game designers, you you probably don't know what's worked for you. For you, like I love graphic design. I think it's just really interesting to think about, for me, graphic design is visual hierarchy. What is the most important thing I want people to see? When do I want them to see it? Yada, yada. But for you, for other game designers, they may hate that. They might hate graphic design. All they care about is the super cool math formula in Excel that makes the whole game work. And that's fine. Then you need to, you know, outsource that. So I'm I'm always reevaluating the stuff I'm working on to, to, to make sure I don't burn out. And I'm thinking about my podcast and I, part of me thinks I should maybe drop down to fortnightly or every other week because I currently release weekly and it's a lot of work to find new guests. So it's, I'm not committing to that, but it's just a thing I'm thinking about because if I have more, I have a higher fun to work ratio, then I think I'll do it longer. So, yeah, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm extremely familiar with, with burnout, um, especially because I suffer from depression, which mm. makes everything <laughs> awful. God. Um, yeah, God. And ma it makes all of that worse, right? Uh, yep. I I've mentioned this on the podcast before. Because of that, I didn't graduate college. I essentially burned out there. I, I was unable to, to mm -hmm. write or go to classes very often or anything like that. And, like, this project, The Thoughtful Gamer, is, is one of the longest-running projects I've ever done in any context. Congrats. Thank you. Uh, and, and a large part of that has been me understanding how to navigate these burnout mm -hmm. pitfalls. And for me, it's been two things. First of all, it has been forcing myself to not put extraneous expectations on myself that I think that mm -hmm. others are putting on me, mm -hmm. which a lot of cases means publishing something that I'm not completely satisfied with necessarily, or I, or I wish I could, I would go back mm -hmm. and edit more, mm -hmm. but I know if I, mm -hmm. if I hold myself to that, it's going to be another week before it gets published. Yes. And the other thing is just doing whatever part of the project I'm able to do at that point, which there, there are downsides to that, right? I, mm -hmm. if someone sends me a game and it's like, they want me to do a preview, but I, there's only three weeks. I, I yeah. just have to say no. Yeah. I cannot commit to that kind of deadline yeah. because I know if I have trouble getting people to play the game or I have trouble thinking of the words to write, uh, the deadline's just going to exacerbate the problem. And I mean, it's still difficult, but like that's been the thing for me is just making just, – just even though it's something you know I'm working towards making more money from mm -hmm. and I want mm -hmm. the Thoughtful Gamer to get big, my process has to be – just getting the things that I'm able to get done. Like even this podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm trying to be more prepared for podcasts, but like the last week was insane. I wasn't able <laughs> yes. to prep very much for this podcast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we were emailing about this earlier today, 
Mm-hmm. You know, like, can, do you mind if we just kind of do this conversationally and, and go for it? I had to actively tell myself, okay, mm-hmm. no matter what, I think uh, I'm just going to, if Patrick says it's fine and he doesn't email back mm-hmm. upset, I'm going to not, I mm-hmm. can't think about what you're thinking about this interaction. I just have to run with it. Yes. And I know I can do it, right? It's those yes. kind of tricks of uh, forcing yourself to, mm-hmm. you, in in my mind, I, I just say, well, I just have to stop caring about it, right? It's not that extreme, but, you know, I use the yes. extreme language in my own mind to get to the point where I'm just able to get something done because, you know, the productive stuff, it cycles out just like the negative parts. Like if, if, mm-hmm. if, you, if you're not able to get something done, it makes it harder to then to get something mm-hmm. done. But as, if you're mm-hmm. actually allowing yourself to, to accomplish things, even small tasks, mm-hmm. it, it's, it makes it mm-hmm. easier to, to continue accomplishing. Absolutely. But, but yeah, so I mean, that to say for people who are listening who have the same kind of struggles, which is, I mean, honestly, probably everyone it, it encounters burnout in some form. Um, no judgment at all. Like I'm intimately acquainted with failure and burnout, but it's in such a fascinating topic in, in terms of understanding human psychology and understanding how to sometimes fight your own mind in order to accomplish goals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, oh man, there's a lot there. There's so much there to unpack. I don't, we could go into, we could go into philosophy and go into a thousand different directions right now. I think you have to know I mean, yourself. I was studying and, philosophy when I dropped out of college. So if you want to mm-hmm. go philosophy, we can do that. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to take it. All right, you dared me. I'm going to take this in a philosophical direction. All right. I kind of think you can only care about so many things to 100%. So I care about a couple world causes 100%. So as, as an example, climate change is something that I care a lot about. And I spend a lot of time and effort into like, so as a silly example, I love almond milk. I don't really drink it anymore because it's, Super bad for it drains all the water out of California, blah, 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 blah. I, won't, I grew up in important. that part of California. So you'll be, you. so if you have some water in 50 years, you know, one drop of that is my, is my, is uh, my contribution. <laughs> but I, but then there's a million other things that I can't think about. People go, I have, I have a couple other issues, which I won't go into just for speed, speediness sake. But if uh, people are like, Hey Patrick, there's people in Africa don't have shoes. I'm like, that sucks. Here's 25 bucks. That's all that I can, I can't spend more. I can't spend any men. I can't think about that problem because if I think about all the world problems, I will get nothing done. So there's like two or three issues that I care a lot about. And you know, there's a two or three people that I care a lot about. And then lots of the other, then you just have to, sometimes you just be like, you know what? I'm going to give $25 to this cause or I'm going to, or Hey Patrick, is this okay? Great. And if I don't say, if I don't say um, that is, Hey, let's reschedule. Cause I really want to have a really prepared interview don't worry about it. You, you can't, you can't possibly care about everyone on the internet when I'm sure when people listen to my podcast, I'm sure some of them want me to do X or Y. They want longer interviews. They want shorter interviews. They want this, they want that. And I can't make everyone happy. So there's only so much you can care about. And you, you're right. You have to keep creating. And I think you have to make it easy for yourself to create. Going back to what we said earlier, so many board game people on my show recommend paper cutters. Like sometimes it's worth an extra 20 bucks just to make certain, give yourself less work so you have more time for the fun. So I don't know, that kind of ties it all up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, no, that's well said. I completely agree. Yeah, you have to make yourself not become overwhelmed by it. Right? Yes. I mean, it, it just, your brain, at least my brain, mm-hmm. likes to latch Everyone's onto brain. those things. Mm-hmm. To different degrees. I mean, yes. uh, my wife Amber, like she can, she can sit at a, at, because at, her and I now both work from home, mostly, and she can sit at her computer and like focus in on her task at hand. And like, I've learned, I just can't say things to her unless it's super important. I have to like completely distract <laughs> her away. She can lock in, focus on something. And then mm-hmm. when it's lunchtime, she just pops out and then, oh, it's mm-hmm. lunchtime. And she can just go from task to task like that and, and just eliminate all the other distractions. But I, I'm like the complete opposite. I'm all over the place. Uh <laughs> Yeah, it's all the different degrees, but at mm-hmm. some degree you have to you have to yeah. do that. I think just to wrap this all up, at some degree you have to nourish yourself. You have to give yeah. yourself what you need to fulfill and deliver your, your creative projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have anything else to add. <laughs> cool. Well, this is this was really fun. Despite the lack of preparation, I very much in, enjoyed <laughs> uh, talking with you. It, it was covered a lot, and it was very interesting to me. 
Uh, I'm very happy to meet another person. And now I assume you're a real person. I'm not, you know, I only see you on a screen, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you're real. Pretty I'm not sure one of the, I, deep confirmed. Fake. I'm not a Russian Twitter bot. Correct. Correct. <laughs> so that's exciting. Great. Well, thank you so much again. Remind us how people can find your work, get in touch with you. Sure. So um, let's see. I'll give you a couple options. So IndieBoardGameDesigners.com is my podcast. You can listen listen to me blab even more there. If you are interested in any of my games, which is only one right now, you can go to LaidBack.Games. That is my publishing company. And then I'm on Twitter as at BFTrick. That's B as in board game, F as in fun, and Trick as in trick-taking games. So you can bug me in multiple places. There you go. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, you can check my stuff out at thethoughtfulgamer.com. You can support the podcast and everything I do by going to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find me on social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.